Cynthia leaned over to me. She sort of lowered her voice and she said, you know, race, it's a problem. I said, mm -hmm. <laughs> and from oh, that see. moment, okay. you know, we began to bring it back out of the realm of whispers to think about how um, each of us in our disciplines um, are affected by the other. Yes. Um, that, uh, that the use of algorithms in certain legal outcomes, in things like bail hearings and in, 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 in carcerality, um, but also in insurance and in finance and everything else, um, is certainly directing and undermining um, some of the precepts of due process. The more I read and the more I read about race and the pervasiveness of racism and how it permeates absolutely everything, um, the more I realized I knew nothing and um, also realized that we have to have a better understanding of literally the roots of how all of this racism is entering the data because in machine learning you train algorithms based on historical data and if you you can try to learn and then adjust but if you want to learn from something that's reasonable you have to understand where is all of that stuff and that's what uh, Pat and I were talking about and we talked about different fields different subfields in medicine, in genomics, in uh, housing, and so on. And Pat has this phenomenal intellect and breadth, <laughs> and you seemed to know experts in all of these areas. Oh, I had a wish list. I had a wish list. <laughs> and also, but it is because I've been teaching um, mm -hmm. uh, collaboratively, in, mostly in the area of uh, genomics and, and DNA. I was teaching with Robert Pollack, who's a, bi a geneticist and biologist at Columbia, uh, co-teaching with him a course called Human Identity, DNA, and the Scientific Revolution. And uh, uh, it was, I think, a small leap to think about uh, how race, as it's embedded in our society, is predictive of very particular outcomes, and that prediction architecture is really a reduction to begin with, but then the question of how algorithms are further reductive and push those reductions out into society at large, it was a very similar problem to the way in which, for example, population genetics is taking a particular history, um, a, 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 a particular history of percentages, octoroons, half-breeds, that sort of thing, and then putting it out back out the world, reinscribing um, these structures of segregation and of division um, that I think wh whose habits of thinking are endemic in not just race but society generally but uh, but but the fact of the contest between precedent as a legal structure and prediction <laughs> as a model that, that you're dealing with from a very different perspective <laughs> clash come together and um, affect what we think of as discrimination. Um, the, the, so, um. Then on the computer science side, there are several people who have been looking at these questions. And um, my hope was to bring in a few representative samples or a few uh, of, the, of the best, but to sort of sprinkle them throughout and uh, try to open a dialogue between the computer science community, the, the theoretical computer science community, and the much broader community that had all of these kinds of expertise that we really need. So two of the highlights for me were um, Dorothy Roberts, I think, mm -hmm. saying don't treat race as the variable treat racism as the variable. That was actually going to be <laughs> all for you my, too. Yes, that was going to be my answer. Because I think that comes up over and over exactly. again as a yeah. stumbling block. But I think, you know, a, a, a corollary of what that is, was, is, is that race is to some degree, or to, I mean, it, it, race, let me not qualify that. 
race is incoherent right. um, as a category. And racism derives its power precisely from that incoherence. Mm -hmm. um, and that it moves, it's mobile, it's, it's not the same thing all the time, and it means something to do. And, and the goal posts keep changing. And the degree to which it becomes treated as though it's a static thing um, blinds us right. to its ubiquity right. uh, and to its, again, the underlying power of it mm -hmm. being shape-shifting. <laughs> right. Um. Interestingly, I've been um, in contact a lot with the Census Bureau lately because of um, their forthcoming deployment of differential privacy. And um, I, I noticed that a surprising fraction of the decennial census has to do with race and ethnicity. And I was very curious, for technical reasons, whether race that people report for themselves changes or not. How, does it stay fixed, or do people vary it? And according to the Bureau, it varies wildly. So there's a, and, and it's the, the same easiest person. way to look up uh, the, the, the um, incredible variation in not just what the census takes, but how people mm -hmm. self-identify um, yes. is to, there's a, a, there's a so-called data artist named Josh Begley, and he does, an exhibit, if you look it up, Josh mm -hmm. Begley race box, he takes the census from its origins in the 1700s all the way to the, and, and you can go through and see all of the different categories and racial categories, right. but uh, but it's, you know, just in our time, people suddenly have started using the word biracial as though there's, as though we are by anything or, or the, I mean, the, the sort of implied purity of these mm -hmm. categories. But in fact, simultaneously, these categories have social meaning, they have social consequence, and they do, they, they're linked to, okay. um, to particular social outcomes. So it's important to be able to find some vocabulary to describe it, but also to continuously interrogate <laughs> what this means, and it varies with mm -hmm. politics, with moment, with migration, uh, uh, you know, with, with things like the Chinese Exclusion Act, who's Asian, who's South Asian, um, um, whether or not the largest demographic in the United States is descendants of slaves within the United States, or whether or not it is people from the Caribbean, or from Brazil, or from Sub-Saharan West Africa. Mm -hmm. um, those sorts of things inflect um, the kinds of obstacles and the kinds of, again, social outcomes that we're talking about. Um. So I think uh, another couple of things that really struck me uh, was uh, the articulation of the desire to abolish population genetics as a field, as a research discipline, and all that that entails. And um, the discussion of how the, I forget the name, um, the medical data the no no the med oh. Oh, not medline but the national, something very close to that in yeah. name um, that the national, it, the, the national library of oh, the index of oh, the index right. Yeah, yes, yes, right. the index of yes. right how the articles are uh, imbued with these racial categories that uh, have been dressed up as if they're biology or and it, it doesn't make any medical sense. And so, so much of that is suspect, and yet... It, and it doesn't make any human sense. It doesn't make any human this sense. was Evelyn Indeed. Hammond's um, right. pointing out that the categorizations that have been carried forward to this day go all the way back to Louis Agassiz's yeah. mongoloid. I mean, they're still, we're still using words like mongoloid and caucasoid and, exactly. yeah, I'm exactly. sorry. No, 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 it's helpful. It, yeah. Right, and so... Mm. If this is what you're starting with, what are you going to come up with? Yeah. This is the classic garbage in, garbage out. And uh, so, so this was all very interesting. And uh, there's been a lot of talk of writing a manifesto and starting um, a movement to, to, to mobilize around the ethical use of data and algorithms, but from this very informed uh, and disciplinary perspective. Yeah, or a, a kind of ethical code. I like yeah. the word ethical code. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Manifesto sounds <laughs> like it should be on a flag. <laughs> but, yeah. is, but just as, as, as right. a set of these, yeah. summarize some of the concerns that we've come away from. 
in this meeting. So I think we, we do yeah. hope to come up with some sorts of documents and resources and so on. Yeah. yeah. Um, algorithms are being used in ways that foreclose uh, the sort of human judgment with which the responsibility of courts and um, uh, sort of liberty interests are ordinarily patrolled. And so the use of algorithms in, say, uh, uh, the granting of bail or the granting of parole based on the likelihood of, resi of, of recidivism um, is to some degree, in some jurisdictions, being governed by uh, algorithms that are proprietary. So one really doesn't know what the metrics are of that. But uh, some reports suspect that it must be things like zip code, which is not about what you have done. It's not about your individual likelihood of going out and repeating, but it, it's associational. And it, as a matter of due process, the larger association of where you live becomes a kind of algorithmic redlining um, that it says that you're from an area, a dangerous area, whose uh, uh, population has a higher risk. And therefore, that, um, um, that probability is assigned to you as an individual, and it becomes disabling. It becomes hobbling in terms of your life chances if you don't even know that that's what you have to respond to. <laughs> Um, where you went to school, what high school you went to, what the gang rate is at that school. And then there's, I mean, aside from what may be built into these algorithms, there's the problem of the fact that they are proprietary, they act like witnesses. Our Constitution says you have the right to confront and cross-examine <laughs> those witnesses, but if they're proprietary algorithms, there is no chance to excavate them and figure out what the, you know, what it is that, who or what this witness is against you. Um, and in addition to that, um, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the way in which algorithms are being deferred to disables the actual social workers or the uh, opinions of bail uh, or, uh, officials in jails or wardens, for example, who might be making a different disposition based on the fact that they know you intimately. And instead, the, defer the deference goes to these these agglomerations of metrics that are beyond you, that are abstractions of um, of your um, um, their stochastic models of who you ought to be or who you might be, who you will be, but they're not about who you are. Um, yeah. So some. Oh, please. So so while simultaneously agreeing with everything that Pat has said, she's also touched on some really interesting technical points. Uh, for example. Um, talking about the proprietary nature of the algorithms, it's not clear that if the algorithm were not proprietary, it would be any better. If the algorithm were public and available for inspection, it's not clear that anybody can understand what an algorithm does. And that um, uh, one of the speakers at the workshop was uh, Zachary Lipton, who wrote a wonderful very broad audience friendly article called The Mythos of Model Interpretability. And it it's sort of very thoughtfully lays out what could you possibly mean when you say you want to understand what the algorithm does. Here's one meaning and here are some problems with that. Here's another possibility and here are problems with that. And it's not intended to be a final word, but it's it's very um, it's very compelling in terms of how difficult it is to understand what an algorithm is doing. Another, oh, did you yeah, want to and I was going to say, I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't a, a myriad number of flaws, but right. basic things like saying who you associate with, yes, um, not even associate with, but where you live, right, uh, or who's lived in your building mm -hmm. as a way of judging you is sort of, uh, it, it's, it's, it's like uh, McCarthyism. Absolutely. You know, it's like who you're hanging out with rather than a judgment of, and and so that that mm -hmm. those kinds of metrics are very clearly. Illegal if they were you if they if you could disaggregate them from the from 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 the algorithm and that's mm -hmm. all. Uh, there are mm -hmm, some things mm -hmm. that are very clear that you. As I said, I was agreeing contest. with you, but yeah. I was also yeah. highlighting yeah. some issues yeah. that it's like yeah. it, you, if the some if the algorithm allowed you to figure out that that is what it was doing, mm -hmm. then you would you would say, oh, this is disallowed. But mm -hmm. it, it's there's no guarantee, even when you see the algorithm mm -hmm. that its form would allow you to understand that. And if it had been trained on data that 
that had that message in it in some form, then what what is produced, the classifier that's produced, or the scoring function that's produced, doesn't necessarily label and say, oh, this is why mm -hmm. we are yeah. including, you know, we're giving this yeah. score. OK, so that was one technical point. Another technical point was, um, you know, Pat mentioned how the algorithms provide predictions. They, they give you a probability that somebody is going to, I don't know, commit another offense or whatever it is. And then the question is, what does that probability mean? So let's think about, um, let's make it more neutral. Let's look at a tumor and say, what is the probability that this tumor is going to metastasize if you follow the following course of treatment? Well, you can't sort of run this experiment over and over again with the same tumor and, and say, OK, in 30% of the chance of, uh, trials it metastasized. So you have to assign a, me a, a meaning to a probability for this individual. And that's something that nobody understands, I think, really mathematically, unless maybe the Bayesians uh, have a view of it. But um, so, so I think this is, one of, this is maybe the central problem of a big portion of AI right now is to understand the meaning of a prediction score. I mean, for me, it's, it's not just that the algorithms are opaque, it's also that they are designed with efficiencies in mind, yeah. and efficiencies are reductive, so the, the, the combination of reductiveness, efficiencies, as you say, at the structural level, which often come with Costs. economic efficiencies, yeah. cost-benefit analyses that have you know, that, that sort of reproduce themselves in things like the Boeing catastrophe yes. or the Flint water, you know, we're going to save money. And, but, but nevertheless, efficiency is held out as a value that I think uh, mutes the human cost of using an algorithm, per se, uh, for, for example, in the context of child removal. Um, in some counties in the United States, there has been great conversation about using these because they're efficient, and they're supposedly better, easier, and I think, you know, in many people's mind, less assailable. Um, they have more authority um, than the variability of judges or social workers' judgment. Um, but I, I think the deference is frequently rooted in discussions of efficiency. We don't have enough people to do this anyway, and this is as good as it gets. Um, and it takes these broad assessments of very broad populations with no, I mean, it's, it's I would phrase it a little bit differently with very little um, um, accountability for the incredible complexity of a family unit. Or not, a unit sounds too bounded. I mean, really, is for, for the family context, for the larger dynamics of family. Um. So I really have a lot of questions around this. Mm -hmm. And I'm, uh, there's just so much I don't know. But this debate about. Um, uh, clinical versus actuarial methods is very old. Uh, in penology, it dates back at least to 28, 1928, with Burgess saying, you know, prediction is feasible about how criminals would do coming out. And then in psychology, dates back to Paul Meal, 1954. And the the as I understand it, and I may be wrong, but the evidence seems to be that actuarial techniques are more accurate than uh, individual clinical judgments. And um, um, I don't know what to make of that because it, 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 it flies in the face of uh, uh, the idea of the, the image of the really experienced and wise judge, clinician, whatever, making a, a prediction or, or determining whether somebody is or is not a danger, um, and, and just these sort of cold, hard numbers. And I, I, I mean, I just have a bunch of questions. But the literature, the, the things that I've been reading lately seem to say that you know, the statistical methods are more accurate as a group, but not necessarily, of course, for individuals. Yeah, I mean, and maybe at the collective level, for right. certain in certain contexts. But there's also, by the, I mean, one, if it's done absolutely well, then this is a way of 
uh, you know, if, if it, 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 it so depends upon what information goes into the algorithm. Absolutely. And whether or not it is mm -hmm. actually reporting what it's supposed to be yes. reporting, as yes. opposed to being used to make right. decisions right. that affect right. in ways for which and this the, data isn't applicable because right. it's not a group. You're dealing in right. a... Right. And, 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 and the child welfare yeah. example that yeah. you were alluding to from Allegheny County is a great example because um, it's, it's using uh, um, whether the child will be removed from the home in the next two years and whether there will be a call about the same uh, family or child in the next two years. It is using those as proxies for whether the child is actually going to be abused or neglected. And you know, just think geographically, if you're in some really remote area, what's the chance that someone is going to call a, complaining about your treatment of your child versus whether you're in a uh, densely packed neighborhood where people are observing you all the time. So it's just a wonderful example about how these efficiencies that you were talking about in the proxies are just and what it is that we're calling accurate, because if it's just exactly. a feedback loop, exactly. you know, exactly. then it's you know, then mm -hmm. that accuracy doesn't right. mean anything other than we. That's that's <laughs> this the is, point. This is the problem. Yes. And so, on the one hand, Twenty Three and Me says it's not going to use race as a category. It doesn't want to reinstantiate. But on the other hand, it couples with um, the uh, World Football uh, FIFA, FIFA. Mm -hmm. and uh, to identify yourself as, uh, you know, if you you know if if you have. X percentage, I mean, just the very language of percentages um, mm -hmm. that come from Ireland, therefore you should root for Ireland. So they're reinstating a kind of positivism um, of identity that is rooted in genes, that is rooted in blood. They're using the vocabulary with which we all grew up, which is that these identities predict outcomes. And even as they're denying it, they're re-inscribing it. I think that's why the whole premise of breaking us into these, uh, into these categories is, is a new form of speciation. Right. And it's a new form of segregation, and it's a new form of um, what some don't identify as racism. But I think if race is viewed as a category mistake, <laughs> we are re-inscribing old vocabularies, filling them with new meaning that is actually biologized, which was the dream, <laughs> which was Hitler's dream. Now, now these categories really are going to have biological meaning, which will carry all the social baggage of previous generations.